Okay. Okay. So, first of all, uh, thank you very much, uh, Miguel and Edu and Irene, for the opportunity to present this work here. So, today I'm going to be talking about mainly this work with Mariana Graña, Thomas Grimm, Damian Van de Heisten, and Eric Klausin about uh, the tadpole conjecture in the strict asymptotic limits. So, I will be a bit more precise about what I mean by strict asymptotic limits and also tadpole conjecture. But the general idea behind this talk is to try to study this tadpole conjecture, which in a broader sense is uh, study the problem of modular stabilization and the modular stabilization program. And in particular, since we seem to live in a world without um, many massless scalars, there should be a way to stabilize moduli. And in particular, it is a very interesting question whether in compactifications with many moduli, it is easy or not to stabilize many of them or all of them. And this is basically what the tadpole conjecture talks about. So let me go very quickly to, to the point and try to tell you the, the, the setup in which we are going to work for the rest of the talk. And then uh, we will go into the details. So the idea is to consider F-theory compactifications so we consider a theory on a Calabria fourfold with fluxes. As we all know, uh, as soon as we introduce these four form fluxes, there is a scalar potential that is generated and has this form. Let me start introducing a little bit of notation now and just rewrite this in terms of this pairing, which is just the wedge product between the two forms integrated over the fourfold and the Hodge norm, which is positive definite. So we have this positive definite term and this pairing term, which is the tadpole contribution from the flux. And the idea is that, as uh, probably all of you know, uh, the vacuum condition for this setup, so we can find vacua uh, when the four form is self-dual. So basically, we have uh, we introduce our four form fluxes, and there is some moduli dependence introduced through this Hodge star here, so that we can get different equations for the different moduli, and maybe we can fix them. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to focus on the complex structure sector only, and I will going to try to stabilize as many moduli as I can there. And in order to do that, we can make the technical assumption that the, the four form flux is primitive so that we forget about the Keller moduli. And this is what we have. Okay, so we are going to consider these kind of fluxes. Now, there is one other important thing that is generically present uh, on a Calabria fourfold, and is going to be important for the rest of the talk, which is the Hodge decomposition and the Hodge star, so that we can have and we can take this four form cohomology, the primitive part of the formal cohomology, because as we said, we are just considering primitive fluxes, and we can decompose it into this PQ decomposition as usual. And the Hodge star takes a very nice form on, on, on cohomology when it acts over vectors on these spaces. Now, another key ingredient when we do this and when we introduce these four form fluxes is that they introduce some D3 range charge. There is some D3 range charge stored in the fluxes so that the total D3 range charge has to be canceled because we have this compact space. So this contribution together with the contribution from the number of space time field in the range and the contribution coming from the other characteristic has to be canceled. This is just the usual tadpole cancellation condition. Now, this has to be positive. This Q for self-dual vacua is positive. And this is also uh, in the large H3,1 limit, which is the one we are interested in. So basically, what we have here is that, oops, sorry, we have this bound for the Q, this upper bound for the Q, so that if we want to be able to satisfy the tadpole uh, condition, this Q has to be bounded by the Euler characteristic over 24. Now, what the tadpole conjecture says is that the flux contribution necessary to stabilize a large number of moduli n actually grows linearly with the number of stabilized moduli. So this Q grows as alpha uh, times the number of stabilized moduli, at least with this alpha greater than one third. This means that for large H3,1, so for a large number of complex structure moduli, we can never satisfy this when we stabilize all the moduli. And this is the statement of the tadpole conjecture. Basically, it is telling us very roughly that if we are interested, for example, in compactifications in which we can stabilize all the moduli, we better look for compactifications with few moduli. Because at least in this restricted uh, setup, so at least uh, for the complex structure sector in F-theory compactifications, we can make this more precise. And we will see 
this linear scaling here. So this is the goal of this talk, to prove or to examine this in the strict asymptotic region of Moyoi space. And this is what we're going to, to, to what I'm going to try to tell you during the next few minutes. So the outline of the rest of- Sorry, can I ask huh? a quick, quick question? What's, what's the argument for the one third there? Is, that, is, is there a reason for that particular value? Uh, I think the one third uh, is basically based on examples. As we will see, so what we are going to do here uh, is, is not really sensible to the numerical coefficient. We are going to be able to, to prove in this strict asymptotic limit the linear scaling with the number of stabilized moduli. But uh, as far as I know, basically this is more mostly related with the, the, the examples that, that, that they have. But I mean, maybe, uh, I don't know if any of the authors of the original conjecture are here and want to make some comment or maybe we can say it at the end. But uh, as far as I know, it has basically to do with the, with the examples. At, at the very end, I will try to tell you when we expect to be able to see something related to this in our analysis, but this is not included in our current analysis. Is that okay? Sure, thanks. Okay, thank you. So as I was saying, basically the, the rest of the talk is going to be divided into two parts. The first part will be a bit of a mathematical review about asymptotic coach theory. Of course, this is a super uh, broad area of mathematics. So we just try to pinpoint two or three main ingredients that we need, but I will try to be specific and tell you why we need them and why they make this analysis uh, very doable. And then we're going to take that and apply it to this case, to the case at hand, to the modular stabilization uh, in F theory with uh, primitive four form fluxes. Okay, so let me start and let me try to go to this part of the title, the strict asymptotic limit uh, and what I mean by that. So the idea is we have our Calabria fourfold and we have the modular space Without fluxes, we can move freely there. And with fluxes, we basically stabilize moduli or, or at some point there or at some regions there or whatever. Now, the idea is that what one can do is to try to go close to the boundaries of moduli space. And let me clarify that this is not something uh, different to what we usually do. We usually go to a large complex structure points or things like that because we that's where we have perturbative control and we have a, uh, uh, let's, let's say uh, parametric control over the, the, the expansions and all that. So what we're going to do is to work close to these boundaries in modular space. Now, not just complex structure, large complex structure, but any boundary uh, in the modular space. And close to any boundary, we can parameterize the boundary itself by some local patch with some coordinates, such that we have some real part and some imaginary part and the boundary itself is located at infinite imaginary part. There is an important piece of information about the kind of singularity, about the kind of boundary that we have, which is that we can encircle it. And basically this generates a monotromy, which is equivalent to shifting the action. So going around is equivalent to shifting the action by one unit. And basically this monotromy, for example, uh, encodes how the period vector transforms under, under this. Uh, and circling of the of the boundary. Now, with this monotromy, basically, we can encode all the information about the boundary or most of the information about the boundary. Uh, and in particular, we can encode everything that is going to be necessary for the rest of the talk, as I will explain. And in particular, it will be in these log monotromy matrices, which are kind of the generators of these monotromy matrices. So to each boundary, we can associate one monotromy matrix and we can calculate this n. Keep that in mind. Now, if we zoom in here, we are close to a boundary. The asymptotic region is defined by just making all these actions much bigger than one. And this allows us to drop some subleading corrections. But moreover, we are going to work in this strict asymptotic region because as you will see, it will allow us to give very explicit results and very neat expressions for the hot star and for the kinds of fluxes that can appear, which are the relevant ingredients here in our problem. And this strict asymptotic region, apart from making all the moduli large, includes one more thing, which is an ordering. Basically, we send the first moduli that we call S1 to infinity first, and then the second after, and so on, so that there is some hierarchy between them and some ordering. Okay, This allows to drop polynomial cor corrections in these ratios, and this allows us to give these very explicit uh, results. So 
This being said, this blue region, this strict asymptotic region, is the region where the rest of the talk uh, is going to, uh, I mean, this is the region about which I'm going to talk during the rest of the talk. And all the results apply there, okay? So now it turns out that as one goes to this boundary, the, the Hodge decomposition that I told you before, that is very useful to control the, the Hodge star, actually degenerates and uh, it, it, the geometry can become singular and whatever. But there is a way to extract these infinities and define some boundary structures, some more refined structures, so that we can extract some useful information from there. And we can extract this behavior of the Hodge norm close to the boundary by using the information about these boundary structures. These boundary structures are two. The first one is a boundary Hodge decomposition. This is not the same decomposition as we had before because we have extracted the infinities. This decomposition does not depend on the moduli that go to infinity, whereas the previous one that holds all over the moduli space depends on all the moduli generically. And then there is a, a set of n commuting SL2 triplets. So if I send n moduli to infinity, I am approaching n boundaries. I have n monotony matrices. From those, I can construct these n's that I, I told you before. And we can complete this with these ends. We can complete them to n commuting SL2 triplets, which act on this vector space on the primitive four from cohomology, so that we have a lowering operator, a raising operator, and a weight operator. And basically, with these two structures, we can give this very precise expression. So let me tell you how this works very quickly. So the idea is I have my usual four from cohomology. I send some modules to infinity. As I told you, this structure degenerates. And Basically, it, it, there is a way to extract infinities and to define some refined uh, splitting there. Formally, this is called a mixed Hodge structure, but this is not the important uh, for our purposes here. The idea is with the SL2 triplets that I told you before, we can basically classify this according to the weights under the weight operator of these SL2 triplets. So that if these guys, these elements on this vector space start splitting, splitting around here, Basically, I keep track of the height in this diagonal, okay? I if I have several modules, I go into infinity. I start here. I send the first modulus to infinity. So I get to one of these diamonds and I record the L1 associated to the first modulus of all the elements here. I go to the second. It splits further. I record, uh, I record the L2 and so on. So basically, I end up by having a bunch of Ls, a vector of Ls, for each element here. And these cells are going to be important because they are going to play a crucial role in the behavior of the Hodge star. Now, the other structure that we had, namely this boundary Hodge uh, decomposition, allows us to define a boundary Hodge operator, which actually acts very nicely into these L subspaces because it maps from L to minus L, and that's it. So that the pairings that we have are such that only L and minus L talk to each other, so that is a positive definite norm in the boundary, so that only when the two L's are the same, this is non-zero. Now, with this, with this L's and this boundary Hodge star, we can already give a very precise expression for the Hodge star in this strict asymptotic limit. So close to the boundary, but now like in the moduli space, not just in the boundary, but in the moduli space, when the moduli are large and when we have this ordering that I told you before. And this expression is very simple for vanishing actions. You take an element of one of these VLs, which we call L is just the weight under the N SL, uh, under the weight operator of the N commuting SL2 triplets. So I take one of these, and basically this acts as the ratios of the actions to the powers of L, L1, L2, and LN that we recorded before and then the boundary operator that maps the L into the minus L. This is without actions. With actions, the thing is a little bit more involved. Basically, the way to proceed is you take VL, you apply this thing, this action dependent thing, which basically maps VL by expanding the exponential, it maps VL to itself, and then to lower subspaces by applying the lowering operator. Then to each of these subspaces, we apply this formula. So we get this same, the action, the, the vanishing action formula, and then we rotate back. But the key thing is that we can keep track 
of all the explicit dependence on the actions and on the actions as soon as we know all the acts. Now there is one last thing that I want to explain, and then we will go and apply all this to the self dual vacuum that I told you before. And is that we have all these SL2 triplets, and we can actually do more than classify them you know, and classify the primitive four form cohomology by the weights, but we can actually arrange this, uh, we can decompose this vector space into irreducible representations of these n commuting SL2 triplets. And as usual, it is very useful to look for the highest weight states. And then we can generate all other fluxes from the highest weight state. So the question here is. What are the possible highest weight states? Can we say something about them? Can we classify them? And the answer turns out, turns out to be positive. And the idea is that we start with, as before, we start with the cohomology. And then as we go to the limit, the, the, the primitive form from cohomology starts spreading there. But the highest weight states can do very restricted movements in this diagram. The, the rules for this can be derived from this uh, theory of uh, from asymptotic Hodge theory. I don't have time to explain it here, but basically let me give you the rules. The rules are very simple. For this guy here that corresponds to the 4,0 form, to the holomorphic 4,0 form, form, it can only go up here. So it can go up, it can skip some of these steps or whatever, but it can only go up, it can ne never go back and it can skip. But the important thing is there is one element here. So there is only one highest weight state as co that corresponds to here. So there is only one SL2 representation. Everything else has to come from this inner part. And it turns out that this inner part is restricted to move into this restricted uh, diamond, which actually looks very much like the diamond of H3,1 copies of K3 surfaces. Let me remark that we are not working with K3 compactifications or anything like that here. It's just any Calabellao fourfold close to the boundary in the strict asymptotic limit behaves like, in terms of SL2 representations, one SL2 representation coming from the 4,0 form that can be involved, and SL2 representations coming from this interior part. And then these guys, the green one cannot move, and this one can only move to these two places. So we can really just Counting the number of options, we can classify all the possible fluxes, but a small number of them coming from the SL2 representation of the 4,0 form. And all of them have to come from one of these highest weight states, nothing else. And then we can generate the rest by applying the lowering operators. But this is it. So this is probably the most important message from all this analysis. One of the most important messages is you can have your favorite for Fall Calabria. It can be very complicated, whatever. You go close to the boundary, strict asymptotic regime. All the primitive form of cohomology is of this form in terms of SL2 triplets, except for one that can be more complicated, but as we will see, will not play an important role uh, in, in, with respect to the tadpole conjecture. But everything else has to be of this form. So let me stop for a minute, summarize the results, and then very quickly apply them. So the idea is, as I said, we are in this blue region here, this strict asymptotic limit. We have these boundary uh, uh, structures and they allow us to array, uh, basically classify the elements the, in the four form, primitive four form cohomology into irreducible representations of the N SL2 uh, and the N commuting SL2 triplets, which are orthogonal among themselves. All but one of these SL2 representations are simple and they take weights between plus two and minus two. And then we have this explicit form for the Hodge star close to the boundary. So now let's go and apply this into our problem. We have our problem, which in this strict asymptotic limit reduces to the self duality condition in this SL2 limit. What we have to do is to introduce some action dependent fluxes this becomes clear when one takes this into account and sees how this acts. But basically, let me introduce this thing, which if you remember from how the SL2 star acted on actions, is very similar with this exponential here. In terms of these jihads, which are, include action dependence, we can expand them into L subspaces. So into, we can uh, expand into the VS, into the weights. And then, since different L's and also different SL2 representations uh, decouple, we can separate this 
into this very neat expression. So that we have that these, these equations separate into as many equations as different L's or pairs of L's are populated in the, by the fluxes or the action, to be, to be more precise, the action dependent fluxes. So the only thing that we need to do to stabilize moduli is to consider this thing. And we have the particular form of the possible fluxes that can appear because we classify the irreducible, uh, as a, the, the irreducible representations that will arise. So by going case by case on this equation, we can see what happens. So let me give you an example. We have our equation here. We have, this is the G4 hat. And let's take the flux that I told you before, one of the four examples that I gave you, which is the one the zero to one. So it is the one that in this inner diamond was here. We turn on some flags around there. This is four from flags. This is just the basis, the vector, the, the, the basis element along this uh, uh, weight. Then we can construct the G4 hat for these flags and it populates the same B02 and the lower spaces because we act with the lowering operators and it goes also to these two spaces. We can also allow for fluxes along these two spaces this zero along this space and along this other space. This is the total tadpole contribution. And then we just have to apply the self-duality condition. And it is particularly simple. We have just three subspaces here. This is mapped to this. So this is related to this. And we get this expression here. And this is related to itself. So with this expression here, everything else is orthogonal. So from here, we stabilize the action. Uh, then this should be a plus two. I thought I fixed this, but okay. I keep writing the same types over and over again. So this is the action. This is the section. And very importantly, to fix this, there are two important things. One, we have to have G02 flags because otherwise the action would not be fixed. And also to have a real solution for the, for the section. Notice that this is proportional to a tadpole. So we need a positive contribution to a tadpole. So we fix this, but the moral is we have one SL2 representation, we are able to fix one action and one section, and we get one, at least one positive contribution to a tab. We can do this systematically for all the other four representations. For this one, we just can't stabilize anything, but for all the other ones, the results are the same. One SL2 representation fixes one saxionic and one actioning direction, and it gives a positive contribution to the tab. Now, the single SL2 representation that we haven't uh, studied in, in detail here, the one corresponding to the 4.0 form that can be very complicated. It can be as complicated as you want, but it is orthogonal to the rest and it can fix at most four moduli because at most it can populate four different L's. So this means that if we want to stabilize a large number of moduli, which is the case which is relevant for the tadpole conjecture, we will have to stabilize it with these guys. We will need to introduce these guys. Now, one could think, okay, what if I start combining these things and then try to reduce the tadpole or whatever? Again, these are orthogonal. So the best, well, the best you can do to act on some action, some field with more than one of these is to act with several SL2 representations on the same section and the same action. The only thing you will get is some uh, compatibility conditions, but you will never lower the tadpole. So tadpole wise, the most economic thing to do is to turn one SL2 representation for each modulus. And then as we saw, we get at least one positive contribution to the tadpole for each SL2 representation. So basically this is it. Let me very quickly go uh, to the result and then finish. We have the tadpole which we can write in terms of the action dependent or the action independent fluxes, the pairing is uh, invariant. We can separate it into different SL2 representations, different contributions for SL2 representations since they are orthogonal. Within each SL2 representations, representation, we can consider the different weights. And then here we restrict our sum to positive else. This greater or equal is basically because we are neglecting possible extra contribution that could be positive coming from L equal to zero, which are the ones that do not stabilize this, these ones coming from this thing here, for example. Now we can substitute directly the self-duality condition. And now here we have as many uh, terms as SL2 representations. 
one could think, okay, we are done. Now someone could come and say, okay, but be careful because here you have this jihad. So this depends on the action. So maybe you can have cancellations. And this is fair, this is a good uh, point. Now it turns out that if you remember, for each SI2 representation, the highest uh, state that is populated is always pure flux because the action dependence comes from combining it with the lowering operator. So basically we can eliminate the summation over the L and restrict only to the highest uh, state within each SL2 representation, then this is pure flux. And then basically we have this thing, these gammas are just the, the control parameter for, the, for being close to the boundary, but you can just stay in this line. And as we said, if we want to stabilize n moduli, we need at least n SL2 representations. We will have n contributions here, which are positive definite. So this is the linear scaling of the tadpole conjecture. Okay. So let me summarize. This is what we found. Basically, for a large number of stabilized moduli, one needs to use this in the strict asymptotic limit. One needs to use these representations here because everything you can do with the other one is to fix at most four moduli. Each SL2 representation fixes one modulus and gives one positive contribution to the tadpole. This is the linear scaling of the tadpole conjecture. And the key point is there is this qualitative difference between a small and large number of moduli. Because for a small number of, of for a small number of moduli, you can use this special, this more cumbersome SL2 representation and get some intuition that things can mix and this or that. But as soon as you want to stabilize a high number of moduli, you need to turn on these guys, and these guys give you this linear scaling. So this goes uh, along the, the ideas of the tadpole conjecture, also the qualitative idea that there is this linear scaling. So just let me very quickly flash some outlook and open questions. So, sorry, outlook, we need to still clarify the quantization in this SL2 basis. We did some numerical uh, 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 exp uh, explorations and we found that there is no scaling of the quantization in this basis with the number of moduli, but we cannot prove that analytically. This is why I was careful not to call this a proof. This is the only missing piece, but numerical evidence seems to be in favor of this. And now possible extensions go deeper into the moduli space, first to this nilpotent region when we don't have this uh, disordering, and then uh, one can have subleading polynomial corrections. This would be where we could be sensible to this so-called linear scenario by uh, Fernando, David, and Max, and originally by Eran and collaborators, that maybe there could be some, some possible uh, uh, challenges for the tadpole conjecture there. So if we manage to go there, we could be able to see this in our uh, language and see whether it applies or what is going on there. Uh, there is also more related comments on this by Eric and, and, and Severin. And then one could try to go deeper into the bug. This is a long shot, but there are some interesting results on, on, on the algebraicity of the 2,2 uh, Hodge locus for, for these four forms that maybe could give some hint. So this is it. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for one or two quick questions for Alvaro. Yeah, sorry that I got a little bit over time. So Severin, I think, has a question. Please submit yourself and just ask. Hi, hello. Yeah, thank you for the very nice, uh, nice talk. Um, I have a brief question regarding, so you have this cartoon where you drew the strict asymptotic uh, limit as this kind of region, right? Mm -hmm. But isn't that a bit misleading? I mean, there isn't really a region, right? It's, it's really, if you go really strictly to that limit, you can ignore all these corrections. Um, so in principle, you always have some, some correction to your analysis, right? Um, so yeah, my question yeah. would be, do you have some argument why these corrections would not spoil your, your counting or your, your linear relationship? Yeah, so, so this is the thing. So basically, uh, the, the strict asymptotic limit, yeah, basically we need this 
hierarchy, basically to drop these corrections. Uh, if you, for example, make the moduli of the same order or things like that, you need to introduce these corrections. These are actually the corrections that uh, in this case, for example, seem to be crucial. This would give in the large compressed structure point the alpha prime corrections and these kinds of things uh, in the large uh, volume thing. So, uh, but the thing is, uh, on the one hand, this, uh, this mixing, let's say, that would be introduced by these extra corrections. So it's actually much more limited than one could expect. We don't have like, so as I said, this is, I cannot say anything uh, definite on this, but we expect this mixing to be very much constrained. And also what one can see is that expectations that one, one can draw from just uh, assuming that some Calabria exist with this or that, uh, uh, possible fluxes or this or that possible configurations is not so easy to get in the sense that everything has to reduce in this limit to these four kinds of fluxes, let's say. And typically, uh, you know, this is hard to see, for example, when you do explicit things in the large complex structure point or things like that, because this is somehow encoded into the possible quadrupole intersection numbers uh, and so on, which is very hard to, to, to see explicitly. So mm -hmm. this is so it, going back to the question. So we don't have any sharpest statement to see that this is not go, I mean, for sure. This is going to play a role, but it can be more constrained that, than one could think. And this can be seen already at the level of extrapolating some of these constructions, for example, to the strict asymptotic limit where things are more, more constrained. Mm -hmm. well, what I mean, I think is, um, so if I understand you correctly, you need roughly one flux per module or so, something like that. Mm -hmm. So assuming you, you would choose not to switch on a lot of fluxes, therefore the corresponding moduli according to your analysis would not get a mass. But then what is telling me that these corrections, which I in principle have, are not generating masses for them? Yeah, no, uh, that's, so first you need one flux per module, but you need one flux in this SL2 basis, which can map to many fluxes or different, like in the original basis, this can be very involved or whatever, but in this special basis, which is the non-trivial thing, you need just one flux. But yeah, like typically, so if you want, what this is telling you is the most you can get is some modular stabilized and some other by the corrections with some high uh, yeah. mass hierarchy. So if you want, at least we can say, the tadpole scales linearly with the masses, with the module whose masses are stabilized at high, at a higher, at a hierarchically higher mass. And then the other things, uh, we are, that, that's what we expect to be able to, to explore. But yeah, there is, apart from the fact that the mixing is more constrained than one could think a priori, I cannot say nothing like explicit about okay. that. Okay, maybe maybe we can postpone any further discussion uh, or questions uh, to offline. Uh, or and yeah, if this was a swamp plant seminar, I would suggest Slack. You can use the swamp plant Slack too uh, for here for for, the, for questions that arise here. Uh, in fact, we might put the link. <laughs> um, um, so uh, now we have uh, Nicolas talk. Uh, okay. Let me stop the recording and then restart the recording. Stop the recording.